I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast, the week starting Sunday, August 29th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, real data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see remnants of a gale uh, in the far southeast Pacific with 28-foot seas, but moving out of the California swell window, and a tiny, small new gale southeast of New Zealand also generating 28-foot seas, but not expected to do a whole lot. Let's get into the details. As usual, we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds of about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, just like this right here, a push in the southern branch of the jet stream. That's the northern branch there. Here's the southern branch. Move pushing to the north. That helps create a clockwise flow aloft and at the ocean surface. And of course, a clockwise flow in the southern hemi is the hallmark of low pressure. Low pressure, it's deep enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, generate seas. Seas, as they radio radiate away from the fetch area, if they're high enough, generate swell. And swell, of course, as it impacts your beach, turns into surf. All right, so we have a little trough here being fed by eh, maybe 120 knot winds, maybe capable of supporting some degree of uh, uh, sea formation, but not a whole lot. And then there's another sort of a trough here in the far southeast Pacific, but that appears to be fading out. Let's uh, look forward and see what's supposed to happen. So we get into Monday, the trough in the uh, southwest Pacific gets e progressively weaker and starts pinching off. And the trough in the southeast Pacific pushes out completely out of the California swell window. So we get into Tuesday, the trough, the remaining trough, look, there's almost no wind in its apex here. There is a little bit blowing up under New Zealand, but this is really the start, you can see here, of a ridge, the opposite of trough. Winds pushing far to the south over the ice line, which is somewhere around 63 to the south in this area. And so offering nothing here, but again, maybe offering a smidgen of some uh, support for gale development. And there, as we get into Wednesday, you see winds pick up 140 knots and pushing pretty quickly off to the east. But there's a trough here nonetheless. So maybe some support for gale development as we get into Wednesday and almost Thursday. And then the jet turns into this zonal flow, uh, running from the west to the east, almost in a straight line, no troughs, no real ridges, winds about 140 knots, but no support for gale development. And that continues in that sort of zonal flow. Now it moves north above the ice line on Friday, but still no troughs indicated. And then as we get into Sunday, a ridge starts building the far west Pacific and maybe a weak trough over the central south Pacific. So maybe, maybe some hope for gale development there, but we'll just have to see on that. So let's go take a look down at the surface. Sur surface level pressure, surface level winds, and as expected, there is a gale here south of New Zealand. We know there's a trough there. It's actually producing a tiny little micro area of 45 knots south winds, so maybe getting some traction on the ocean surface and north of the ice line. Then the remnants of our previous gale that was uh, is actually traversed the whole Pacific, we'll get into that in a minute, fading out out of the California swell window with 35 knot west winds. As we get into Monday, the gale here and uh, well southeast of New Zealand starts not getting very organized. Yes, 40 knot winds here in the east quadrant, but notice the arrows all aim to the south, no fetch aim north, other than this tiny area of 35 knot winds here in the west quadrant aim north. So maybe maybe some support for gale, uh, some you know swell development in, into late Monday, but probably not a whole lot. We get into Tuesday, all that just kind of fades out. It's out of the California swell window. High pressure building uh, east of New Zealand. Uh, another little gale forecast as we get into Thursday here. Now the ice line, we'll have to look at this, but doubtful that this is getting much traction on the ocean surface. The ice line is probably right about where the fetch is, 45 knot winds. So uh, we'll see. But it lifts northeast as we get into Thursday. Uh, so maybe some hope there. Still barely, not even clear of hardly the, the 60 south latitude line. And then more fetch into Friday. That is clear, but most of it aimed due east, not anything to the northeast. 
uh, and more of the same Friday night and then out of the California swell window by Saturday. A rather weak wind pattern follows that. Another broad sort of a gale trying to organize 180 hours out under New Zealand, but no real fetch of interest with 30 or 35 knot winds and sort of a muddled, undefined pattern over the East Pacific. So some minimal hope, but no clear-cut, large-scale signs of any, you know, significant swell class developing storms in the Southern Hemi. So now we're looking at the wave model, the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. But we're going back to Thursday, about, well, what is it, three, three days ago. A gale did develop south of New Zealand, 20 9.1 foot seas right there and that built a little bit as we got later into Thursday with 29.7 foot seas uh, and pushing off to the east it continued on Friday weaker seas in about the 26 27 foot range and then tried to rebuild a little bit on Saturday with again 29 foot seas not even breaking the 30 foot threshold and then Sunday that was this morning pretty much pushing out of the California swell window. So there is some swell being generated or has been generated by that system. Nothing huge. I mean, really quite small swell, maybe, you know, two foot Hawaiian on Thursday and then maybe pushing into California on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday sort of thing with waves in the three foot range. That's, you know, not accounting the effects of swell enhancing bathymetry or other top spots could maybe see some shoulder high sets or maybe, maybe a little bit better at some of the better spots on the peak. All right. Anyway, looking forward, here we are Sunday, nothing. I mean, we're really looking for 26 foot seas are better and we're not seeing it uh yeah that's uh on tuesday on the very edge of the california swell window aimed southeast so nothing there we this system here you see this on uh forecast on wednesday uh a day or two ago it was really sp it, the models had suggested it not getting crushed by the ice line here again which is it 60 south dipping south to about 63 south and they were the model was suggesting maybe like 50 foot seas in this area on thursday but that has all vanished now we're left with well thursday midday a tiny area of 30 foot seas and that's it so the gfs model has sometimes does these strange things where it early on it shows real strong and then about five days out before it forms, it kind of disappears. And then magically it reappears about three days before it's actually supposed to form. So we'll keep an eye on this area. But as of right now, things not looking, you know, 26, 27, 28 foot, barely. There we go. 30 foot seas on Friday, but almost out of the California swell window. So right now, odds pretty low of any swell be developing behind the swell that's already in the water pushing off to the north and then we're out a week and that's the end of it i mean we're late in the summer season but not that horribly late um so i mean it would be surprising to see something develop but we're not holding our breath and we really are looking north hoping for something better up there so our next hope, wind swell or tropical swell of some origin, but there's nothing on the charts. We'll just get right to that. So wind swell, main feature. In fact, there are waves in uh, California, Northern California on Saturday, with locally generated wind swell, you know, some, I don't know, shoulder or head high waves, maybe at top spots, you know, if you're in the right place at the right tide, <laughs> but not, nothing to write home about. Um, so, uh, Sunday, yes, north winds, 20, 25 knots, generating some wind swell. So we get into Monday, more of the same, mainly focused over Cape Mendocino. No significant trades pushing into Hawaii, generating no wind swell. But Cal for California, North California, Central California, yeah, wind swell looks possible on Monday. Then we get into Tuesday, the fetch decreases a little bit, still 20, 25 knot winds over the Cape Mendocino area, so a small wind swell. Pretty much the same on Wednesday, Thursday, kind of the same thing. Maybe a little bit of fetch building at 50 knots, also pushing into Hawaii. So maybe some, you know, rideable east wind swell at the exposed east facing breaks. So we get into Friday, fetch dies in California. Now notice low pressure here in the Gulf of Alaska. In fact, notice it even on Thursday night pushing 
across the Gulf with 35, almost 40 knot winds. I mean, don't really believe that. And then quickly fading to 30 knots as we get into Friday night. Wind swell fading out for California. It's driven by this gradient between high pressure uh, north of Hawaii and heat low inland. But with the low pressure moving in, that sort of cuts the legs out of the high, reduces the odds for wind swell, at least from the high pressure system. Low pressure theoretically pushing into British Columbia, the first low of the fall season and a pretty weak one at that. So even in Saturday, Sunday, no real clear-cut signs of decent wind swell forecast. And then uh, and Hawaii, nothing there. So kind of a, it's not till we get into, oops, into Sunday night, we'll say that some wind swell again starts look looking possible for north and central California. So early week wind swell fading late in the work week and then maybe starting to redevelop again for the week beyond. A quick look at the wave models for the North Pacific since we're in that season. You can see wind swell generally. Let's see, so that's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 foot seas. Okay, take what you can get, right? Oh, 11.6. Okay, you can sort of see it down here. That's the only thing going on in the Pacific. We're just going to blast through this, and you see as we get into Thursday, that even fades to about 8 or 9 foot, something like that. But this low starts building here Thursday night, south of the Aleutians, pushing over the date line, seas to 19 foot, supposedly, almost 20 feet as we get into Friday. If that were to happen, maybe some 12 or 13 second period swell could could develop. But given that it's five plus days out, probably we're not going to believe any of that just yet. But at least there's something on the models. And it's been on here for two or three days now. So maybe something to look forward to. Uh, again, size-wise, it would be pretty small, whatever swell was the result for Hawaii and the probably exposed breaks north of Point Conception. Nothing huge, but maybe a tease to start fall off. And just a quick look at the uh, the freezing level. This is for Squaw Valley, but we'll use it as a proxy for all the Sierra. It's for, uh, freezing level above 14,000 feet into about September 1st, then it dipping down to about the 12,500 foot level for one, two, maybe three days, and then back to 14,000 foot plus. So maybe just a hint of a little bit of cooling, but not enough to go, oh, it's the start of fall. No, just just a little break in the monotony of otherwise hot temperatures. Maybe good to give the firefighters a bit of a break, but even that, probably not too much. All right, let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden Julian oscillation and, of course, the El Nino Southern oscillation? As usual, we're looking for signs of the active phase of the Madden Julian oscillation. The MJO is this periodic weather oscillation. There's an active and inactive phase. They rotate diametrically opposed or opposite one and each one uh, to one another around the equator, moving around from west to east around the planet. When the active phase moves over the Pacific Ocean, it helps feed energy to the jet stream, helps create Kelvin waves, which in turn can take warm water in the west and transport it east, which is also um, perhaps if you get successive active phases of the MJO, can help kick off El Nino. Inactive phase does the exact opposite, steals energy from the jet stream, sort of stomps on uh, swell production potential. And uh, then if you have successive inactive phases of the MJO, then that sort of is what drives La Nina. All right, so we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. That would be low pressure in the West Pacific. That would be a uh, reduction of trade winds in the West Pacific. So this is data from the TAO buoy ray series of buoys strung across the Pacific used for monitoring El Nino. There are wind sensors on those buoys, and we can get not daily, not hourly winds, but five-day average winds. This is the West Pacific here. There is the equator. This is the East Pacific here. That is New Guinea there. The arrows are what we're looking at. Winds to be strong. These five-day average winds out of the East over the East Pacific. 
fading a little bit. It's just five degrees north and south of the equator that we're interested in. The central Pacific here, yeah, out of the east, but not too strong. And then building up over the west Pacific, the Kelvin wave generation area. When the active phase is over the west Pacific, that's where we generate Kelvin waves. But it's not the actual wind speed. It's the difference for this time of year. And you see Actually, in the far east Pacific, yeah, winds a little bit, the arrows a little bit out of the east and longer than usual. So uh, east winds a little bit stronger than normal. Maybe a little bit of some anomaly going on here, but then continuing more or less out of the east. A little bit weaker than normal, almost westerly anomalies over the central Pacific, and then weak easterly anomalies over the West Pacific. So in all, no clear sign of the active phase of the MJO anywhere in the Pacific. Five-day, 850 millibar wind anomalies, okay? So this is not down at the surface, is up about, what, 4,700 feet, but a good proxy for what's going on at the surface. What are we looking at here? Okay, well, this is the past five days, 23rd, 24th, 25th of August. Uh, the equator right here. There's South America, Central America, Hawaii there, uh, New Guinea there, the Philippines. So the area we're interested in, the Kelvin wave generation area, because when the active phase moves over this area from 135 east to about 170 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, so you sort of draw a box in your mind right there. And we look at the arrows, or you just look at blue means easterly anomalies. That'd be the inactive phase, the MJO. The reds, westerly anomalies, roughly equating to the active phase, the MJO. But it's over here that really matters. So inactive phase in the Kelvin wave generation area on the 23rd of August. Same thing on the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th. I mean, just from the date line west, it's all easterly anomalies. Clearly no sign of the active phase of the MJO, a steady inactive phase, appears to have been in control at least the past five days. Let's go look uh, ahead for the next seven days. Now a little bit different style chart here. This is the whole planet on one chart, but the same deal. Blues are easterly anomalies. Yellows are westerly anomalies. The blues typically, especially when they're over a large cohesive area like this, typically associated with the inactive phase of the MJO, the one that steals energy from the jet stream, the phase that doesn't support gale development. Uh, you can see, oh, okay, where are we? The dateline right here, 180 west. The, uh, the West Pacific starts about 135 east, so right about there, and ends over here at about 80 west right there. But the Kelvin wave generation area cuts off about 170 west. So this is the part that we're interested in right in here. And you, you see it looks like it's been the inactive phase of the Kelvin wave in the Kelvin wave generation area since the 9th of August. And more so, the same thing continuing for the next week, and if anything, building and filling the entirety of the Pacific at the end of the model run, not a good sign. So when in doubt, look further out. All right, so what is this? Outgoing long wave radiation, another component of the MJO. Again, we say the MJO in the inactive state acts like high pressure, and high pressure is clear skies, no rain, sinking air. Uh, the active phase is like low pressure. That would be uh, yeah, um, reversal of trades, rainfall, a lot of cloud cover. All right, so this is about the cl this chart describes or, or depicts the cloud fall cover or amount of sunlight outgoing long wave radiation, the amount of sunlight reflected off the ocean surface. Uh, yellows and oranges, more sunlight re reflectivity, meaning high pressure, meaning the inactive phase of the MJO. The, and where are we here? Here's the equator. There's South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, Kelvin wave generation area right there. So a weak inactive phase of the MJO in control today. Five days from now, same deal. If anything, it's building a little. Ten days from now, building a little more, and then stable two weeks out. This per the statistic model. Now, this is the interesting thing. The dynamic model is sort of suggesting the opposite, where this shows a building inactive phase. The dynamic model suggests a fading inactive phase over time. Neither shows the active phase doing anything. It's locked in the Indian Ocean here. We'll go look at the other one. Yep, pretty much the same deal. 
So uh, the active phase, the one we want to see, not in the Pacific for the next two weeks, according to either model. Looking in phase diagram charts for the same two models, statistic here, dynamic model here, um, the MJO moves west east. How do you read these? Okay, phase one, two, three, four, but we'll ignore that. Basically, it's just the position of where the active phase of the MJO is. Either it moves from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent like Bali to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, right there, and then back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot, where is it? You can't really see it. It looks like it's right about there. That's where the active phase is, so in the middle, central Indian Ocean. And the further the dot is away from this circle, the stronger it is. So a weak active phase in the Indian Ocean. These are the forecast tracks of it and strength. So over the maritime continent two weeks from now, an exceedingly weak, according to the statistic model, Dynamic model has the active phase moving to the East Indian Ocean and very weak. So, again, no real hope offered by either model. All right, the upper level model. This goes out 40 days, uh, five days per panel, eight panels here. Uh, there is South America, Central America, the equator, zero, right there. Okay, New Guinea, the Philippines, Kelvin wave generation area, right there. All right. Yellows and oranges are dry air, the inf inactive phase of the MJO. And this is a statistic model. So basically, this is showing the inactive phase moving out and over uh, Central America come about mid-September, September 13th or so. And the active phase finally moving from the Indian Ocean, seeping its way gently into the West Pacific over the Kelvin Wave Generation Area by the 18th of September, and then continuing its trek across the Pacific through the early part of October with the, a weak inactive phase following behind that. So if there was a target for storm production, we'd say it's roughly mid-September through about Oh, mid-October, something like that. So we have about two and a half weeks before we get into that uh, sort of regime, according to this model. The CFS model, it goes out one month. So this is a little bit, again, this is the whole planet on one chart. There's the date line right up the middle. So Kelvin wave generation area, the important West Pacific area we're interested in is right from about there to there. The blues are easterly anomalies. The reds are westerly anomalies. The solid contour here is the active phase of the MJO, but it's over the maritime continent. Um, and not in the Pacific. Only at the very end of September do you see westerly anomalies starting to seep into the West Pacific. So this is even a bit more delayed than the previous model, which was talking maybe mid-September. Now we're saying the end of September is when the active phase would show up in the West Pacific. That is when we would get storm production. Now the real interesting thing, we're going back here in July, big active phase, the oranges are westerly anomalies. Notice the cluster of tropical cyclones around that. Then notice no inactive phase, just nothing at all. A dead neutral pattern for, you know, since August 15th to at least the middle of September, if not longer. And the low pass filter here suggesting a high pressure bias trying to develop over the date line with just no MJ with no MJO activity. And I think someone even made a comment, uh, something like, this is boring. There's no MJO activity at all. I agree completely. Um, but when you get these periods of whether where the MJO just goes to sleep and there's nothing, typically what follows is on the back end of it, you get a little spike in activity, you know. Uh, nothing holds static for too long. So we're not going to get too freaked out right now. And if anything, we're kind of hoping this might usher in something stronger as we get into later in fall. And then finally, the three-month CFS model. Okay, now the forecast is the top. What's happened in the past is down here on the bottom. The dateline runs right up the middle. Kelvin wave generation area starts about 135 east, so right about there. The box we're interested in is about in this area right here. You notice right now, and here's where we are today, lots of blues, easterly anomalies. This is 850 millibar wind, so pretty much down at the surface. Easterly anomalies, but notice 
they all start fading out and getting shunted to the east progressively. And as we get into November, easterly anomalies are limited to just the area south of California with a generalized westerly anomaly pattern filling the Pacific. Now, do we believe a model that goes three months out? Absolutely not. But it, they have been, this model has been consistently suggesting that. Another little, we did some digging over the weekend. You know, there's been some talk about well, what is, what are these little boxes represent? And again, in the comments, you know, we'd been using this, not that one, but let's see, that one, which I thought was the latest one, but actually doing some more research. I think this box represents, so the CFS model runs four times a day. We think this is the zero Z run the 6Z run, the 12Z run, and the 18Z run. But this is not just today's run of the model. This Each one of these is a accumulation of the 0Z run over, and this is the part I don't know, either a week or 10 days or some other period of time. So it's literally the average, if I go look at this, it's the average of the 0Z run over, we'll say a week for argument's sake. And this is the 6Z run over the average of a week and the 12Z run and the 18Z run. And then you can take all of that and average it, it's called mean, together and say, okay, rather than look at each one, just generally put it all together and what do you get? You get this picture. We've been using this last one, and I think we I mistakenly was thinking that was the latest run. Every site uses the CFS model data differently, and they do their own flavor of how do you project this stuff. But that that's this seems to be the logical argument for how this one works. I, I could actually write to Kyle McRitchie, and he's the guy that runs the site, and, and get, you know, I've looked around. There's no clear depiction of what he's doing here, no, no indications in the text. But I could write him to find out. But for now, I'm going with that assumption, and I'll keep using the, you know, this the uh, the summary, the the mega blend of everything. So anyway, westerly anomalies. Let's overlay the MJO. We're going to do the same. We'll play the same game with the MJO. There is the zeros, the average of the zero Z's, or the mean of the zero Z's, the six Z, the twelve Z, the eighteen Z. And then everybody all wrapped together. Now, what are we looking at? The dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO. So no big surprise. Here we are today. Inactive phase of the MJO with easterly anomalies. And then as we get into, oh, somewhere around mid-September, the active phase starts moving over the Pacific in the West Pacific. And notice, look at this. It makes it the whole way across the Pacific as we get into mid-October. And it holds in some degree in the Kelvin wave generation area through the end of the model run. And then even the inactive phase, its dotted contour, starts moving into the far west Pacific late October. But even at that, westerly anomalies continue. That is a pretty good sign. And again, the models have been very solid about this for a while. Now, what's driving all this? Okay, for one, this is something to look forward to. This is, we'll say, starting late September, September 22nd and on, we think there's going to be a change in what's happening. Remember, we said there's no MJO signal right now. Things are really weak. It's, you know, there's not a lot of energy in the atmosphere. We think that's going to change somewhere around the end of September and move into a slightly more active pattern. All right, low pass filter. This is the higher low pressure bias. We're going to play the same game again. The zero Z run of, of the model. And you just look, the dotted contour is high pressure bias over the Kelvin wave generation area starting about September 6th. Low pressure bias over the maritime continent. We'll go look at the, uh, the 6Z run. Not a whole lot difference. The 12Z runs. Not a whole lot difference, though maybe the high pressure bet bias a little stronger. The 18Z run, pretty much the same thing. And then everything all mashed together. In fact, look at this. We can go bump, 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 bump. Put them all together like that, and you go, well, they're all pretty much saying the same thing. And then we'll say, well, just look at that guy and get rid of all the data, all the details. You go, okay, high pressure bias setting up just about over the date line, building to two contours. But then as you get into November, sort of like 
the second contour fades and you get this kind of generalized sense that something around here is going to change. Yeah, the low pressure bias is still centered over the maritime continent. You almost wonder if we're not going to start moving towards a change in this, uh, this MJO ENSO pattern that's setting up. No hard data to support that, but you, you just kind of wonder, well, it's the second year of La Nina too. It's not going to hang on. It's not going to rage as much. It almost looks like the peak of it could be right in this window in the late September, early October time frame. All right. And with that, so let's go start talking about this La Nina thing. Enough of the MJO, the longer cycle, the La Nina cycle. What's going on in the ocean? This is the West Pacific here. This is the East Pacific here. We're looking down in the ocean. Again, data from the TAO buoy array, those buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. These are the anchor lines on the buoys, and we're looking down into the ocean. We're trying to look at the balance of where warm water is, where cold water is. So this is average water temperature over five days, the 29 degree isotherm, about 176 east. That's about where it's in. We're trying to see if warm water is moving off to the east. 28 degree isotherm at 178, uh, I'm sorry, 173 west. That's about where it's been for the past week. The 24 degree isotherm, I think it was back at 138 or something like that last week. It's actually inched itself east a little bit. So maybe a weak hint of warm water trying to move off to the east, but it's not the actual water temperatures. It's the anomalies, differences from normal. And look at this, you have a very, this is a pretty bland pattern if there ever was one, which is maybe a good thing for right now. Warm water, one degree above normal in the West Pacific, down about 125 meters, something like that. Then this sort of a break of just neutral temperatures, cooler than normal temperatures down about 200 meters trying to work their way to the surface then the last fading remnants of three different kelvin waves weak ones at that that traverse the pacific or uh, i think it was early in the summer uh fading out so no clear sign of a massive kelvin wave or warm water pushing off to the east that's the bummer the good news is there's no clear sign of a massive cold water pool evolving either that's per this model. This is actual data, and then the models fill in the gaps. Now we have another model here. This is actually saying much the same thing. Warm water pulled up in the west, not making it any further than 160 west, so maybe south of Hawaii. Cool water in the east, but it doesn't look quite as cool as last week. Certainly cooler than the previous model, which is showing that, but here it's what one two three four five six one two three four five now this is showing four and a half degrees below normal temperatures at about what was that about 135 west and at 135 well, there we go there's 135 is about right there right here this one's showing nothing so a bit of a disparity though i suspect this is probably closer to reality and you'll see why in a second Sea height analysis. All right, so what are we looking at? This is South America. That's the Galapagos, so Ecuador would be there. Central America. There's the Yucatan. There's Mexico. Hawaii right there. The equator right there. The date line right there. This is data from the Jason 3 satellite. Strip out all the wave heights. Strip out all the wind waves. Strip out the tides. And is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? All right. And this is suggesting 10 cent the uh, surface of the ocean sphere is 10 centimeters below normal here. Cold water contracts, creates a divot on the ocean surface. Also, if you have stronger than normal easterly trades blowing off of the Galapagos and the Ecuadors and Ecuador here, it might scoop out warm water. Then we have positive anomalies here. There's New Guinea, Philippines there in the far west Pacific. All the warm water that was here displaced to the east at depth, expanding, create a bump on the ocean surface. And of course, if you have stronger than normal trades, it's taking, scooping out the water here, displacing it here, and leaving it pooled up in the far west Pacific. So when we say that previous model was probably closer to the truth, this data is what we're using to sort of, to confirm or to support that, that uh, uh, conclusion.
Upper ocean heat anomalies. This is time. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. September last year, uh, you see warm water building in the West Pacific, cold water in the East Pacific, 130 west. So that's just a little bit uh, so, uh, west of south of the California coast. The peak of our La Nina from last year and it kind of backed off and then redeveloped a little bit. And then in March, Kelvin wave number one, warm water peeling out of this core, moving across the Pacific, driven by the active phase, one active phase, the MJO. Another active phase in late April did the same thing, more warm water transporting to these. A third Kelvin wave in June by the another active phase, the MJO. Notice the warm water in the west quickly dissipated. Now we're back into maybe warm water trying to build in the west, while cool water again sex sets up in the far east pacific an echo of what happened last september here we go the same sort of thing trying to happen again but we suspect not nearly as strong second year of la nina there just isn't as much energy in the atmosphere to support that there's not as much of an imbalance if anything we've overcorrected to the cold side and now we need to swing back towards the to towards a warmer anomaly pattern all right, let's go take a look at the ocean's surface, not down in the ocean, but at the surface, at the surface, because that's what really matters, right? It is surface ocean temperatures. If they're warmer than normal, they support evaporation. Evaporation creates lift. That creates cloudiness. That then transports energy to the jet stream. And the whole ENSO cycle sets up or is driven by that. But what are we looking at here? Well, uh, Chile... Peru, Ecuador right there, the Galapagos there or there. These images don't completely fit together. Um, Hawaii out there, the equator right there. And what do we see? The blues, colder than normal water temperatures. And now we have this thin finger of cold water going literally the whole way across the Pacific. Not super cold, but definitely colder than normal. Bit of warming. You can see this. The warm, any warm anomalies are north of the equator, pretty much from California down to just to north of the equator, and then here off Central America. South of the equator, we have this other secondary long finger of warming coming off of Chile, whatnot, going to the dateline, and almost all the water south of the equator is colder than normal, where north of the equator, most of the water is warmer than normal. Ignore that. That's just the center of high pressure, uh, the summertime high in control. This is the outflow. Um, high pressure circulates clockwise. This is the boundary of that high and the trade winds creating upwelling. And so you get this sort of a pattern. No big surprise, but a little bit of dead air and certainly warming temperatures building along most of the California coast. Even in San Francisco, water temperatures in the 59 degree range, something like that. Quite, quite pleasant by Northern California standards. Now, the big uh, obvious sign, this is a sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. And it's only on the equator that we're interested in the Pacific. Colder than normal waters the past seven days building off of Ecuador. There was actually a warm pool here of temperatures, not anymore, or at least that te te that pool is rapidly fading. Also notice sort of a, uh, a shadow mirror image of it occurring in the Atlantic, suggesting trade stronger than normal here. Again, driven by high pressure here, rotating clockwise, and high pressure down here, rotating, rotating counterclockwise. And you get that mash in between, and then the east, the trades just start picking up. A little bit of warming out here, but this is the big highlight for this week, and not particularly a good sign. All it suggests is uh, a trend towards the building of the second pulse of La Nina. The backed off view, sea surface temperature anomalies, cooler temperatures building along Chile, Peru, and you can just see literally the flow working its way up the coast, to, uh, off of Ecuador, over the Galapagos, and on out to the, uh, to the dateline, driven by trades blowing and trades upwelling along Chile and Peru. We had some warming down here. We were encouraged by that, but that's all gone now. Again, all our warming is just pretty much limited right in here. That's, and again, it's really five degrees north and south of the equator. That's what really matters. 
In fact, here's the sea surface temperature anomaly trend in the Nina 1.2 region. This is the area by the Galapagos and Ecuador. Temperatures, well, they were hanging around normal in June and July. Once we got to about the end of the first week of August, temperatures crashed, tried to rebound, but they're down today, minus 679 thousandths of a degree below normal. So almost three quarters, or let's say two thirds of a degree below normal. Uh, half a degree below normal is the cutoff for La Nina, um, for uh, neutral moving towards La Nina in the official uh, Nino 3.4 region. We're not there yet, but let's go take a look at those temperatures. Here we are, the trend down, 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 trying to rebound a little bit lately. We're only at 234 thousandths of a degree below normal right now, a quarter degree below normal. So we're not even at the the half a degree below normal, the La Nina threshold yet, though we wish we were more up on the upper end of the scale than the lower end. But the good news, and notice the scales are different between these two. So don't don't take that too much. They, the, the software just automatically tries to scale and fill the chart range without leaving a bunch of dead air. So from one day to the next, the scale can change a little bit, or from one one area to the next, it can change. But for right now, quarter degree below normal, not too bad, but not great. And then finally, what's going on on the atmosphere above the ocean? All right, we've talked subsurface, we've talked the ocean surface, and it's the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere, which Matt would that's what really matters. The atmosphere reacts to what the ocean is doing, All right? So is pressure lower in the Pacific or higher than normal? Well, we look at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. Darwin's roughly in the Indian Ocean. Tahiti is in the West Pacific. We'll call it in the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. Actually, it's a little bit east of there, but close enough. If pressure is lower in Tahiti relative to Darwin, the index is negative, and that would be a sign of the active phase of the MJO, or if it was active long enough, a sign of the appending El Nino. But today's contribution, plus 13.59, anything but the active phase of the MJO, and it's been positive for pretty much a long time, suggesting a long-running uh, inactive phase, the MJO, and that is the hallmark of La Nina. The 30-day average takes the noise out of this. Uh, we're at plus 302, and where have we been? Well, we're actually, we were up at 14.8 a month ago, so we're fading just about, yeah, about as low as we've been. Uh, still not even at zero, certainly not negative. So we'll say a neutral MJO, and that's pretty much what's going on. There's no MJO whatsoever indicated or really supposed to for the next week or two. The 90-day average is the La Nina El Nino indicator. Still positive, 6.54. Where were we a month ago? 7.34. So we bottomed out where about 4.88 on uh, August 18th. Then we've been slowly creeping back up. And in fact, let's graph this data out. All right, so here we go. This is uh, the positive SOI values. We'll call this the La Nina side of the, of the chart. The El Nino side is down here. You can see back in uh, April, all of 2019, we were down somewhere in the negative range, minus 10 roughly, eyeballing it, till about January of 2020. And then slowly, oh, and these downward spikes, that's the active phase of the MJO. So when the active phase of the MJO is dominant, you're in El Nino. But when the inactive phase, the upward pulses start taking over and are uh, more dominant, then you move to La Nina. That's what we say when you have more inactive phases, that's a clear sign of being in La Nina. So and that's where we were into January of this year. Then a big dip in active or active phase of the MJO setup almost got us normal and then another pulse at normal then a big rise but now we're in an equally as big dip so we're still bouncing around around normal so though the ocean at this point in time is showing cooler waters atmospherically the atmosphere still is saying well Know, maybe we're kind of more in a neutral pattern, not particularly energetic one way or the other. And just a real quick ch uh, check here. This is a chart 
mapping the strength of the active phase of the MJO, not where it is, not, you know, its position on the globe, just wherever the active phase is, how strong is it? And you can, oh, here we go. So you can see we had a good pulse in like, what was that, May or June or something like that. But then since then, the active phase of the MJO has been pretty, pretty weak indeed. In fact, even in uh, January of 2020, when we started getting into La Nina, you can see how weak the active phase was compared to even, you know, the instance of a, let's say, one and a half or almost two, uh, or I'm sorry, three standard deviation active phase of the MJO, much more common back in 2019, back in 2018. Oh, this is probably a La Nina year here. Look at how dead that was. And so you can, oh, and a serious El Nino year, 2015, not a lot of active phases, but when we got them, they lasted a very long time and they were mega huge and mega thick, even going into 2016. And then things started mellowing out. You see here our active phases. Yeah, there's sort of little blips of it, but just literally nothing going on right now suggesting a rather weak energy pattern in the atmosphere globally right now the hallmark of la nina then finally these forecast from the cfs model for the uh, sea surface temperatures in the nino 3.4 region the official el nino monitoring region uncorrected version here uh, this is the past performance this is our la nina from last winter down with temperatures about Eh, 1.25 degrees below normal, which is pretty good La Nina. And now that with a dotted contour is the is the forecast temperatures dipping into October into probably November down to 1.2 degrees below normal, which supposedly is the same as this one. We don't believe that's going to happen. And then rebounding to neutral after that. PDF corrected version. Again, suggesting a dip to one degree below normal. Now, what was it, maybe three weeks ago, it only, we, this only suggested maybe minus seven-tenths of a degree, which was barely a La Nina. Now the model is saying, well, definitely fully in La Nina territory, but really only from, we'll say, October, November, December, January. What's that, October, November, December, that's four four months pretty much and it's five consecutive months at least to be a quote-unquote official real la nina though atmospherically i would say this is close enough everything else we're seeing other than sea surface temperature is suggesting that we're moving to some sort of a la nina though the long-range model there well let's talk about that so for right now yeah little swell radiating north no big deal be here next weekend something like that into the week beyond that for hawaii maybe on thursday anything behind that eh, maybe maybe not probably not a whole lot um the models looking at the mjo thing mjo pretty weak theoretically moving into late september maybe a decent active phase of the mjo maybe the final push that will sort of dislodge or start to suggest that La Nina is moving out, if you believe a model three months out. Um, that said, cooler water temperatures to prevail at least through all of fall, maybe into the early part of winter. Um, and certainly no clear signs that of anything that's El Nino-like, no suggestion of it, major energy moving into the atmosphere to help really like goose the jet stream and, and like make this winter be something special. The interesting part is we suspect the core of the high of the high pressure over the Pacific might be displaced a little bit more to the west, more over the dateline this year, which isn't this winter, which isn't great for Hawaii, but what it will do is allow high pressure to ride over the high and maybe drop, I mean low pressure to ride over the high, maybe drop down the uh, British Columbia Pacific Northwest Coast, provide 
at least some hope for more rainfall into the southwest U.S. coming as we get deeper into winter. That is purely a speculative guess. We could be completely wrong on that. We want to see where the core of cold water on the equator develops as we get deeper into this La Nina. We're kind of hoping it's more westward displaced than eastward displaced. That would, wherever the cold water is on the equator, North of, north of that is where the worst effects would be. So if the pool of cold water is focused like south of Hawaii out towards the dateline, I guess from your perspective, it'd be more like over on this side of the chart, then that's where the center of the high pressure would be. It would at least get open the potential for rainfall into California and uh, Oregon and places like that. Try to break this drought a little bit. But until that happens, Pretty dry indeed for now. We don't think there's going to be any change until we at least get into late December or something like that. All right. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. Thanks. If you haven't subscribed, ring the bell. Please do that. If not, you can get the videos at any point in time on stormsurf.com. That's our website. All the data you saw tonight is available there. Dig around. Yeah, it's pre it should be pretty straightforward to figure out. If not, send us an email. Put a comment on the video. Any questions about anything or if something we said is incorrect, please comment. And um, we'll, you know, if you know something we don't, we want to hear about it because the point of all this is for all of us to learn and sort of move forward and, and get a deeper understanding of how the atmosphere affects our planet, how it uh, can positively or negatively in fact, impact our surfing, skiing, snowboarding, any of our outdoor sports or, or whatever it is that you do that's outdoors. The weather is a major part of it. It's good to know how the weather affects your passion and your pastime. All right, thanks for watching. We will do this next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks again. Bye.